Professor Yamaguchi has headed the System Dynamics Group of Doshisha Business School at Doshisha University in Kyoto, Kyoto to Japan, presented his macroeconomic model to a plenary session of the System Dynamics International Conference in Seoul, Korea in 2010, which was attended by more than 300 researchers specializing in that field was so well received that on July 26th, the same international conference asked him to speak at, uh, on the same matter, the same matter again, at their meeting in Washington, D.C., where Professor Yamaguchi also made a very well received briefing to a packed room at the Cannon House office building. This is one of the official buildings for the House of Representatives. And we were there. It was really fascinating. The room was, was filled to capacity. And this year, he presents his updated uh, study at, at our, at our uh, conference here. Now, Professor Yamaguchi's study came to us at a very important time and became um, a major event. You know, we have it in your the sheet which describes uh, achievements of the AMI. And so, please welcome Professor Karu Yamaguchi. Thank you, Stefan, for a good introduction. Uh, this is my uh, fourth continuous appearance at this conference, and I was extremely uh, pleased uh, to be here uh, this year because of this book. This came out a week ago. It could be part of my life work, but at the same time, I, I would say this is your book because the uh, main part of this book is based on the conference here. So we, we should, in a sense, celebrate about the product of our meeting here. So uh, I'm going to explain in an hour the essential part of this book. And it may uh, clarify how monetary reform is, uh, is necessary and important for the welfare of our uh, uh, sustainable futures. Okay. Uh, let me start with the main feature of this book. Actually, uh, the, let me uh, tell you why this book is different from almost all available macroeconomics uh, books and professional uh, textbooks. First of all, the title. Title is money and macroeconomic dynamics. So that means money sits in the center of macroeconomic analysis. That money occupies the most important part of macroeconomic analysis. There are not so many books which start with the analysis of money. So that means without the analysis of money, we cannot analyze macroeconomics. That totally uh, distinguish this book from all other existing macroeconomic textbooks. Why it becomes uh, possible? It's because of the methodology I used. The methodology I uh, employed is called accounting system dynamics. That's a totally new uh, approach, a uh, new method to analyze macroeconomic uh, features, as well as all other uh, economics and business uh, uh, models. So it consists of two parts, accounting system and system dynamics. As you know, accounting system is the basis of all social science, as well as all business activities. Corporate uh, uh, financial statement have to come with balance sheet, cash flow statement, and income statement. So those are the behaviors at the micro levels. If you sum up with those micro behaviors, we come up uh, with the macro level of, of accounting uh, systems. So that is a very important part to analyze macroeconomics. And accounting system is a foundation of all social sciences. On the other hand, system dynamics is a foundation of natural sciences, which deal with all dynamic features. So in other words, system dynamics is a, a computer numerical uh, method of analyzing differential equations. So those two robust foundation of social science and natural science are combined to come up with the accounting system dynamics method. So, so this is the first book 
to apply this method to macroeconomic economic analysis. As a matter of fact, I just uh, developed this uh, analysis, uh, an, uh, analytical method, uh, method myself. Then I started using this uh, system, uh, accounting system dynamics to the macroeconomics. So I started with uh, simple macroeconomic systems and I expanded that macroeconomic system to the uh, foreign sectors. So part two and part three are based on the traditional way to analyze macroeconomics. Whenever you look at macroeconomic textbooks, all models are within this area. So in that sense, there is nothing so special to this book. But when I completed uh, this part of the book, the Lehman shock, just uh, Lehman uh, shock or financial crisis just hit our economy worldwide. So as an economist, I was so shocked and, uh, uh, and tried to find out whether my model can analyze the, the, some uh, part of this uh, Lehman shocks. So I tried to look for any information available on the internet. And by chance, I happened to find the uh, American Monetary Institute site, and especially American Monetary Act, the, uh, the, the impressed me so much. So I thought, this is the area I should try my new method to, to, to analyze. So I started working on the American Monetary Act part of macroeconomic modeling. So the first my model was uh, uh, completed in uh, 2010, and I presented uh, that paper at the uh, uh, AMI conference of 2010 under the title of the uh, on the liquidation of government debt. So that became a, a chapter 12 of my book. Then the, I expanded that analysis to include the foreign sectors, and I completed the, my macro models. That became the working of public money, uh, money system, and I reported that uh, result at the AMA conference of 2011. So then I thought, I, now I have done the, that part of my analysis. Then I looked for another thing which I left over. Uh, in my uh, analysis, then I found monetary and financial stability is a part which still I, I didn't analyze. Then I tried to uh, model that part, and I reported that uh, simulation last year. Then I thought, oh, almost my uh, modeling part are done. Then I was invited to give a talk at the uh, uh, New York's uh, conference last May. The Stefan invited me to give a talk at the uh, Eastern Economic Association's conference in New York in May. Then after the conference, he also he invited me to give a talk at the Cooper Union. Then after that uh, conference, a couple of people got together in a small apartment, including uh, Joe Bon Giovanni, and he gave me a very interesting um, uh, suggestion that I should write down another chapter which should not include all technical <laughs> models, but, it, but that chapter should explain what I have done so far. So that's a really interesting suggestion in New York uh, three months ago. Then on, on my way back to Japan, I thought maybe I should write one more chapter. So I worked uh, next, uh, uh, two months, and finally I came up with uh, the last chapter. Last chapter is public money and sustainability. and. Uh, I sent this draft to uh, Joe Bon Giovanni, and he kindly edited all my poor English part. Uh, so this is a kind of, in a sense, joint work. So that is why all this book is our book or your book. So we should be proud of the product of this book out of this conference. That is why I'm so pleased to be here. Okay. So. Let me uh, start with uh, some less, uh, lessons which uh, uh, economists struggle to learn from the Great Depressions. So actually, the, uh, I just summarized, there are two lessons economists in those days studied. First lesson is about monetary reform. So, so this part is already uh, familiar to you. But the, to be more specific, the, 
I mean, after the Great Depression, many American banks are, are closing or are going to uh, 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 bankrupt. So economists thought they have to do something to stop that uh, 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 banking systems all uh, uh, shut down. So they came up with some uh, proposal. Actually, eight economists at the University of Chicago came up with some memorandum. It's called Chicago Plan for Banking Reform. It was privately circulated among 40 people. I'll uh, explain a little more in detail later. Then, two years later, Irvin Fisher, the great American monetary economist, really picked up the idea. And instantaneously, he uh, endorsed the idea. Then, to my surprise, he has written the book in two years after the exposure to this uh, Chicago plan. And that book became 100% money in uh, 1935. Then, at that time, already the uh, more milder part of the uh, monetary reform uh, was uh, legalized under the Banking Act of 1933, Glass-Steagall Act. Okay. That has uh, two features. It has already explained. So then the Fisher didn't give up the monetary reform. Then four years, four years later, he uh, gathered several uh, colleagues and has written another important memorandum. It's called program for uh, monetary reforms. So, and I would like to say those three writings in 1930s should be, in a sense, broadly defined as Chicago plan. The, the, there was a discussion in the previous session about the definition of Chicago plan. So I would like to define Chicago plan, uh, which include all three uh, works in those days. Okay. So this is the first lesson economists uh, learned to avoid the Great Depression furthermore. Then that this monetary reform failed to be implemented. But second, uh, a, a little more milder reform, uh, it's called glass Eagle Act, was repealed in 1999. Okay. So anyhow, this is the first lesson. The second lesson was by John Maynard Keynes, the general theory of employment, interest, and money. So he revolutionized the way to analyze economic, economic, uh, economic behaviors with his concept of macroeconomics. So he actually, we called him a Keynesian revolution. But it turned out that his theory just laid debt and macroeconomic foundation, if we look back from now on, what, what he learns. Okay. So those are two lessons uh, we learned from 1930s Great Depressions. So let me add a little more, go in detail. And anyhow, those uh, two reforms which are implemented are uh, uh, called debt money uh, based uh, uh, reforms. Okay. So uh, let me focus on the real part of the Chicago plan. So Chicago plan, according to this book, the, I have no uh, uh, idea about the Chicago plan until I read this book. So all my presentation are based on uh, the, this uh, book as well as uh, Stefan's book. Okay. So the, in 1926, Frederick Sodi, the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry in 1921, made a proposal to back bank liabilities with government cash. So bank liabilities have to be backed with government cash. That's a very innovative idea. Then this, this has already been covered by Joe uh, this morning. Then that idea was picked up by eight uh, economists at the University of Chicago, and it came up as a Chicago plan for banking reform. So this was uh, the privately written and distributed among 40 individuals as well as uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace. Okay. So, then to be interesting, this memorandum was also submitted to John Maynard Keynes. And uh, here is a very brief uh, comment from Keynes. Much interested by the memorandum which you kindly sent to me. So Keynes was aware of the monetary reform, but he didn't go far. Okay. So that's a fact. Then the two years later, Avin Fisher has written the 100% money. This is a complete uh, 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 book about money. 
And uh, here is uh, his uh, uh, comment. I have come to believe that the plan properly worked out and applied is incomparably the best proposal ever offered for speedy and permanently solving the problem of depressions, for it to remove the chief cause of both booms and depressions, namely the in uh, instability of demand deposit, tied as they are now to bank loans. So this forward was written March 1935. So uh, my, uh, I have a chance to read his book. All important uh, the analysis are already done by Irving Fisher. Actually, I would say there are nothing to add to his analysis uh, besides the, some uh, analytical method. All uh, the uh, important uh, results are just intuitively done by Irving Fisher. So then the four years later, he gathered other, other colleagues, this time from different universities. Then he uh, passed around the so-called uh, program for a monetary uh, reform. So this is a very interesting result, which appears in the, uh, in, the, in the first page of this program. It says, up to the date of writing, July 1935, 235 economists from 157 universities and colleagues have expressed their general approval of this program. 40 more have approved it with uh, reservations. 43 ha have expressed disapproval. The remainder have not yet replied. So this means in those days, 86% of all economists supported monetary reform. If it is a democracy, it should be already implemented. <laughs> so, so we, we, should, we have to remember this part. And uh, this program is so well written. I will uh, quote later uh, from this program. Then the, this idea was still carried over by Milton Friedman, a very famous proponent of the market uh, uh, liberalism. So many people don't know about the Friedman support of Chicago plan. See, let me read. As a student of Henry Simon and uh, Lloyd Mint, those are the uh, professors who, who have written the original Chicago plan. Then I'm naturally inclined to take the fractional reserve character of our commercial banking system as a focal point in the discussion of banking reform. I shall follow them also in recommending that the present system be replaced by one in which 100% reserves are required. So Milton Friedman really tried to implement monetary reform from the 1930s uh, the, uh, uh, reform recommended by his professor up to around 1960s. Then for some reason, Friedman uh, started de-emphasizing the reform. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I think one reason is that uh, kind of more economic and political situation in 1960. 1960s, our economy is growing so nicely well. It's because of the Keynesian revolution of, of uh, macroeconomics. See? The, by the way, the, uh, this title is very, very interesting. General theory of employment, interest, and money. Now you see these orders. Employment comes first. So that's when Keynes uh, uh, they discussed that we have to find out a way to attain free employment. The employment is determined by the level of GDP. So GDP is the same as uh, GDP is determined by the effective demand. So effective demand consists of consumption, investment, and government expenditure. The main part of the uh, effect, effect demand is investment. What does that mean, investment? It determines by interest. So what determines interest? Money supply. So in this way, Keynes is aware of the uh, importance of money, but according to his theory, money is just uh, addition to his macroeconomic analysis. That's the point we have to uh, uh, remember anyhow. Anyhow, his theory has been working so well in 1950 to 60s. So almost all economists are confident that we now overcome all uh, boom and bust and um, unemployment uh, problems. Now we have a very powerful Keynesian theory, and we don't need any other theory anymore. So that, that is why monetary reform has not been paid so much attention, even though Friedman was very active still. 
Okay, that's what I just predict uh, from this uh, historical this, uh, uh, event. So, but this is another interesting point. The ideas which are here expressed so laboriously are extremely simple and should be obvious. So he said macroeconomic theory is very simple and obvious. But the difficulty lies not in the new ideas. That means that he said his idea is not new, but in escaping from old ones which ramify into every corner of our mind. So this is a very good warning, which, which is still applied to us. So, so we have to challenge against the, uh, the uh, ideas which ramify everybody's uh, so far. So, so anyhow, he, he, uh, he has uh, uh, written this preface in 1935. So that means in the same year, we have two great economists uh, uh, who published the, the two influential book. Okay. So this is why the, the, those two books are so important. The, this is uh, the photo of Adam Smith, and we are still uh, 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 influenced by his thinking. What's his main thinking? There are two features. One feature is market, uh, market has uh, self uh, correcting forces. That means eventually market attains equilibrium. And at the equilibrium, the relative prices are determined. And what's the role of money? Money only determines the level of price. So that means, in a sense, money is neutral. So that is market is self correcting to equilibrium. So we should not do anything. If we have woman bus, that's because of the outside shocks, outside shocks. But eventually, uh, a market mechanism will overcome and attain the equilibrium. Then money has no important role. Those are the dominant theory, which is still dominant uh, nowadays. Then Great Depression in 1929 totally challenged old ideas. The economists uh, uh, thought that they, they have to uh, look for a new alternative theories to overcome the realities. So one idea was the Fisher's monetary reform, then the Banking Act of 1933. And this book challenges the neutrality of money. Say money really matters. Money really determines the uh, boom and bust. That was the main, uh, the, uh, main statement of monetary reform, Fisher's statement. Then the Keynes book appears. Keynes book challenges neoclassical theory. It says economy is not in equilibrium state. It is disequilibrium. Disequilibrium, disequilibrium have to be the uh, more uh, uh, the uh, regular uh, behavior of the economy. So he uh, developed that theory against the neoclassical equilibrium theory, and those two theories seem to be working. But the around 1970. After the uh, Nixon shock, the economy, our economy was challenged by stagnation and inflation. Usually, whenever you have inflation, we should have full employment by definition. But inflation coexists with unemployment. So we, we totally have a new phenomenon, which cannot be explained by Keynesian theory. So they call it uh, stagflation. Then the counter-revolution uh, started against Keynesian theories. And that counter-revolution also began to attack the financial market, uh, financial regulations. So deregulation is the new now trend. You see, specifically, we call it market and financial liberals. Especially, we call it uh, efficient market hypothesis, a so strong statement, which, which affects almost all economists. What they, so, they believe is we should regulate market and financial market. They'll come up with a good uh, uh, equilibrium and good uh, asset prices. So eventually, you see, the, that trend also expanded to uh, worldwide kind under the globalizations. And now you see the, the monetary form are totally renewed or just, just, just destroyed. And now all the ideas come, uh, come back. If you look at those things, now you, you can easily predict what will happen. The, the same economic theory are dominant. Then the history repeat. 
as imagined. So we have a Lehman shock of 2008. And I would like to call it uh, second great depression. Many economists try to say great recessions or a financial crisis just totally hide away the essential part of these recessions. Uh, it's better to say the second great depression. I like to emphasize this. If we say the second great uh, depression, then it's a good chance to look back. What is the first great depression? What was the theory before that uh, depression? So. Anyway, uh, after this depression, still we began to face a debt crisis. But to our surprise, to our surprise, this new, new neoclassic, uh, new, uh, new classical theory should be already uh, wiped out. But to our surprise, most mainstream economists think that nothing happened. <laughs> Just it's a kind of outside shock. Now, you see, we are coming back to normal situation. And this is very nicely uh, described by this book, Zombie Economics. <laughs> now, econo those neoclassical theories are now reviving, reviving. And we are facing debt crisis. So, what, what can we do as economists? Almost all economists belong to this school, or a portion belongs to this school, but they are under the same debt money system. And under this situation, zombie economists are now uh, taking over this reform again. So what can we do? Then the, this book says, it is necessary to provide an alternative to the zombie economics of market liberalism. This book said, even though the author couldn't uh, provide alternative, but he said we need alternative to kill the zombie economics. So then I'm free to say my book will kill zombie economics. <laughs> no, it's not my book. It's your book. It's our book because it's uh, come out from our conference. Okay. So the, this book tried to integrate the, these two monetary forms. First of all, it's based on the distributive analysis of Keynes. And again, so this monetary form is carried on uh, by this institute under the American Monetary Act. And finally, it was successful to integrate into this book. So those two lessons we, we studied 70 or 80 years ago are just integrated into this new book. That's how I like to uh, evaluate this book. Then the, I uh, propose a uh, new uh, system which implement American monetary reform as a public money system. So this book is all about debt money system and public money systems. Okay, so that is uh, the, the way uh, we can understand the importance of this book. Then from now, I'd like to just uh, move on to more in detail. So, so now we have a public money system and debt money system. I'll define this a little more later. But from system dynamics point of view, it's very important to have a good system design. Because whenever we try to analyze economic behavior, economic behaviors are influenced by System structure, then that means system structure is uh, uh, created by system design. So this is how we look at the uh, uh, economic system structure. So in this way, I picked up uh, several uh, features which describe this system structure. One, one is who, who issues the money and who owns the issue, issuers of the money. That's a very uh, important uh, uh, feature to distinguish uh, economic st structures. So public money system and uh, debt money system are different uh, insurance, uh, different issuers and different owners. Then the bank reserves have, uh, is also different. Uh, public money system have a full reserve, instead the debt money system has a fractional reserve system. The money supply is also different. Public uh, money system have only one type of money, public money, besides debt money system uh, money are created by uh, different levels, which I'll explain in more uh, detail later. 
then the, uh, we have uh, interest-free system and interest-bearing debt. Then uh, economic policies are also different. This is a new uh, public money policy. Actually, this is a policy just to increase or decrease the amount of circulation of money. So very simple public money policy works. On the other hand, under the current system, we have to uh, apply monetary policy by central bank and fiscal policy by the government. The two different institutions are trying to impose different policies without uh, agreement. So that's a, a source of another confusion. So anyhow, I, uh, I summarize uh, system structures under those four different, uh, five different items. Okay. So let me just from now on quickly uh, review what is money. So this is kind of, kind of repetition. If you are, uh, you are here last year or two years ago, so you have heard of this one. So what is money? You've, you've learned that money exists not by nature, but by law. So I really was thankful to Stefan's book. He just reminded me of very important definition of money. Compared with this money, as a professional trained economist, what we learned is the definition of money. Say money should have these functions, medium of exchange, unit of account, and so of values. Then we are told that gold and silver are qualified to have those three features. That is why gold and silver are by nature money. That is what we are told uh, in our economic classroom. It's totally the upside down definitions. Okay. Money has to be defined as a legal tender by law. Then it begins to show three features. So there are money and gold by nature cannot be money. So it's very important to understand this one. So this is the thing which we learned from this uh, seminar. So thank you for, for good uh, information. <laughs> right. Then the, uh, what is uh, debt money? But very quickly, uh, we define money supply as uh, just sum of currency in circulation and uh, bank deposits. The currency in circulation consists of banknote and coins. Then the, uh, we add bank deposits. Who create those uh, currency in circulation and bank deposits? So here is the latest uh, figure of money supply M1 in Japan, uh, according to the Bank of Japan data. Uh, ah. okay. So. It's a. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, it comes up. So, coins only consist of 0.8%. It's almost nothing. Ah. And banknote uh, consists of 13.5 percent. That's 74 trillion. Okay, uh, it's only 3 percent. We are told here. And deposit in Japan consists of 85.6 percent. This is just a number in computers. And in UK, this is 97 percent. So in Japan, the, we still want to have more real tangible cash in our society. Okay. Well. They who create uh, this uh, debt money, of course, then the coins are only created by the government. The banknotes are created by the uh, privately owned central bank. And of course, then deposits are uh, created as a credit by commercial banks. So that means almost 99% of money in Japan are created uh, privately. So, the, those uh, money is used to control for the benefit of the bankers. So that's the main, main reason, main uh, purpose of the debt money system. So compared with that, the Chicago plan or the American Monetary Act, that is the modern version of the Chicago plan, try to impose very clearly the following three features. Okay. So privately owned central bank uh, issues money. This is a, a debt money system. It has to be replaced with government-issued money. So that means we have to nationalize the central bank. 
but not the uh, nationalized banking system. Banking system have to be left as a private activity, but we have to nationalize uh, the uh, uh, central bank. That's the first feature. The second feature is that 100% fractional reserve have to be uh, maintained. That means we have to abolish the credit creation. That's the second feature. The third feature is money have to be used the, to promote public utilities for the economic growth and public welfare. So those are three conditions so, so clearly stated. That is why it captured my, uh, my mind so quickly. So I, tried to, I wanted to try to uh, test whether this really works in my uh, macro models. So that is how I began to create my models. Okay. So then the, the, let me just go quickly. An um, example of public money, uh, very well known, just pick up one or two. Very famous uh, example of uh, public money is the Greenbacks. It was created around the Civil War in, in the United States. But at the same time, this is a kind of uh, a, a, a miracle history. In Japan, we are also having the Civil War. And uh, Japanese new government are also suffering from the uh, shortage of money. So Japanese government created uh, Dajo Kansat. So around the same time, if you know the uh, last summary, the uh, Civil War uh, general was employed by Japan new government uh, to come to Japan to help the Japanese uh, 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 Civil War for the government. So around, around the same time, two big countries survived by publishing uh, public money. So this is a very important uh, historical fact we should remember. Always uh, public money save when our nations face a crisis. Okay. Right. okay. Then the uh, historically public money and debt money have been in struggle. The, there is no reason to explain, ex explain this one. It was explained by a pamphlet where I just picked up this uh, part. It's not necessary to read this one. So, I wanted to try how American Monetary Act really works. So here is uh, my model. Uh, just let me just uh, pick up the essential part. The, this is a government uh, balance sheet consists of asset side and liabilities and equities. Whenever the government receives taxes, it becomes part of the asset, then they spend. If expenditure is bigger than the revenues, government have to borrow money. So whenever, whenever they borrow money, that enter into the liability as a debt. So American Monetary, Monetary Act said, instead of putting money into debt, why don't we put money into the equity? It's called the seniority, equities. So whenever the government issue money, it enter into the equity. At the same time, it enter into the deposit account of a government as an asset, because this is a balance So. This is a very simple change, simple change in our system. This morning, uh, Joe said, uh, inertia or revolution. <laughs> we don't need inertia. We don't need revolution. Whenever we do, we do try to push system, system push back. So we can't uh, do revolutions. So instead, all we have to do is to change the many minor point it, which you call in system dynamics leverage point. Just put money into equity instead of, uh, instead of debt. This minor change is called a leverage point. This minor change also changes the system itself dramatically. So, so this is the government side of change in the current uh, existing accounting system. Then I call it the central bank public money administrations. The sometimes Fisher called uh, currency commission. American Monetary Act people uh, say monetary authority, but I thought the authority is a little more, <laughs> more authoritative. So I so I just picked up a public money administration as a more milder uh, <laughs> name. So whenever government uh, issue money, so we have to integrate the central bank uh, into the uh, treasury, but we have to keep the accounting system separate. That's very important part. So whenever government uh, create money, it becomes a uh, deposit, a deposit becomes the uh, liabilities. 
this is uh, the uh, uh, public money administration's uh, reserve instead of commercial bank reserve. Then the government issued money becomes a senior asset. So in this way, the, uh, this is a counterpart of the, uh, the uh, public, uh, public money. So under this one, now the, we have to back this uh, commercial bank's reserve with 100% real cash. So how do we do that? So we can gradually increase this reserve ratio to 100% in 10 years, five years, one year. So I did the simulation for three different cases. So the result is the same. So in this way, we begin to raise uh, reserve ratio to 100%. Then at the same time, we issue the money to back this reserve ratio. So this is same as uh, Dr. Kumho's uh, treasury credit something, the same idea. Then at the same time, the, whenever the uh, government issue money, so currency outstanding increase a little bit. But with this money, now the public money as mentioned can just uh, pay out discount loans, which was uh, originally lent to the commercial bank by central bank. And at the same time, the, with the public money, we can uh, pay off the securities. So in this way, gradually, all debt will be paid out, and all uh, former central banks' loans are paid off. Okay. So to be surprised, total money supply didn't increase. Actually, it decreases. So this shows there should be no way to create inflation, because currency outstanding will increase a little bit. But people are confused with the currency outstanding with the real money supply. Real money supply never increases under the Chicago plan. Actually, it decreases. At the same time, interest rate is lower than previous one. So that stimulates the economy. That means we have more, a higher economic growth. We have higher economic growth with no inflation. That's totally proved. So this model is uh, free to any economist. If those economists uh, from mainstream want to challenge, I like to let them learn this simulation by themselves until they are convinced. Because see, this is a way uh, to uh, spread uh, new, uh, new reform. Okay. So this is, anyhow, this is uh, the system structure. Then what kind of behavior we can obtain from this uh, different system structure? Now the, we want to discuss only uh, two things, monetary stability, financial stability, and government debt. Of course, we can discuss employment inequality and sustainability, but I just want to focus on those two things. How we can uh, uh, figure out the stabilities under two different systems? So this is what the Army Fisher uh, said in the program. Say, a fractional reserve gives our thousands of commercial banks the power to increase or decrease the volume of our circulating medium by increasing or decreasing bank loans and the investment. The bank thus exercise what has always and justly been considered the prerogative of sovereign power. As each bank exercises this power independently without any centralized control, the resulting changes in the volume of the circulating medium are largely haphazard. This, is a uh, this situation is the most important factor in boom and depression. So this is a result of the uh, monetary reform. Uh, Fisher's uh, memorandum. That means fractional reserve system create boom and bust. Boom and bust. The here is uh, uh, Fisherman's uh, Fisher's reasoning. Sir, it's very simple with simple numerical example. Let's say this is 1926, 1929, 1933. This total uh, money supply circulating medium. This is a checkbook. Check with same as deposit money. Pocket book is a real cash money. So. So the boom and depression since 1926 are largely epitomized uh, by these three figures, 26, 27, and 20, for the three years, 1926, uh, 29, 33. The changes in quality were chiefly in the deposit, as the essential part of this depression has been the shrinkage from 23 to the 15 billion in checkbook money, so 23 to 15. That is the wiping out of 8 billion 
of Dallas of the nation's chief circulating medium, which we all need as a common highways for our business. So he said, now after the depression, people want to keep cash. So pocket money increased by one billion dollars. So by withdrawing one billion dollars, banks are forced to cancel or shrink or crunch eight billion dollars. So suddenly, 23 billion dollars of checkbook money are shrinks to 15 dollars. So that's the source of the uh, instabilities, monetary instability, which he, uh, Fisher pointed out. As long as we have a fractional reserve system, we cannot avoid this sudden financial or credit crunch. Okay. So that was the, uh, his uh, reasoning, and I tried to just uh, check whether this is really proved with my models. So this is a model. So the, whenever bank make uh, loans, at the same time the, uh, we create a deposit as a liability, and sometimes the the loans uh, comes from the demand from producers. Sometimes banks uh, can make more loans. Sometimes they can't uh, make loans. So I just uh, uh, learned a very simple uh, Monte Carlo simulation. That means sometimes uh, commercial bank meet only 20% of demand for money from producer. Or sometimes they try to uh, uh, low more 180%. So what will happen? So the, under the uh, public money systems, the, this money is only uh, lent out from the government. Okay. So those minor changes. But then this is a result of Monte Carlo simulation. The inflation rate, this is a debt money system, public money system. And wage distribution, this distribution. Then GDP itself. Now you see which system stabilize our monetary and financial uh, future. Obvious, right? Obvious. Then the, this is a official statement. The 100% system would be no cure all for business fluctuation, though it would help reduce them. So Fisher knows it's not a, 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 a placebo, but it reduce boom and bust. So it's a good reason to, uh, to uh, recommend monetary reform to reduce boom and bust. So that's one reason. So, here is the latest uh, figure, or actually, this is a three slides from now on are taken from the seminar of uh, normal securities held uh, uh, last May, very recently. So the, this is uh, the American bank's uh, the balance sheet. This is asset liabilities, asset liabilities in 1926, 1933. The, the unit are different, but you see the minus eight, eight 8.8 .8 billion dollars. So this, this fits to the Fisher's idea. So that means after the Great Depression, American deposit shrinks by 8 billion dollars. So to recover this uh, Great Depression, we have to create money supply. That means we have to create more deposit. How we can do that? Well, this is 1936. Money supply seems to increase uh, 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 yeah, before depression levels. But who created money? So you see, the private loans stay the same. That's the private banks never made loans. They who made loans? Only government. Government are forced to borrow money, to put in circulation, that simulate the economy, and finally, American money, money supply come back to pre-Great uh, Depression levels. Then can we apply this same policy nowadays? Nowadays. Uh, as you see, the, our government is now suffering from debt. Actually, American government is now facing new debt ceiling. Japanese government cannot uh, borrow money anymore, European, UK. So government cannot afford to borrow money. So who can create money supply? What's left, theoretically? Who can create money supply under the current debt money system? If government cannot borrow, who can? As a final resort, only central bank can, can do, have to do. So this is what they have been doing after the Lehman shock. So they are forced to increase, but they can only control base money, that's MEM0, money supply. So they are forced to buy government securities and uh, subprime loans to increase the base money. But you see, base money increase, but it doesn't 
change my surprise. So it's totally the new phenomena. That government, uh, central bank totally lost control of the money surprise. So where does that money goes? It never goes to the real sector. It goes, it stays with the financial sector. That's why Q1 only supports stock price and it goes to the uh, BRIC countries, it's supporting BRIC countries, the stock market, financial sector, but it's never helping the real sector. So that uh, was American uh, problem, but it's not the American problem itself. You see, this is the uh, EU. EU also increased uh, money supply, uh, um, base money, but total money supply stayed the same. It never happened historically. So that is why now central bank is totally out of control of all money supplies. So this same in UK, UK cannot control money supply. And Japan was uh, the first country uh, which introduced QE. We, uh, we have been suffering from the uh, depression for the last 20 years. In 19, around 20, uh, 2000, Japan introduced uh, QE for the first time. At that time, many uh, Japanese criticized by um, uh, many bankers. This is not the, the regular monetary policy, but Japan has no policy but to increase QE. Then it didn't work. Now they are forced to do again. So that means our financial system and the debt money system totally is out of control. There is no way to uh, control them. So this is the essence we have to learn. Okay. Now we stop, uh, okay, we have to, okay, three minutes, right. All right, then the uh, second one is the uh, uh, debt crisis. So this is uh, also the quotation from the uh, uh, F uh, uh, Fisher. Under the present fractional reserve system, the only way to provide the nation which is circulating medium for its growing need is to add continually to our government huge bond debt. Okay, so it says government debt is a built-in our debt money system. This is a very important part. This is built in. So we can't escape from debt as long as we stay under the debt money system. So here is the uh, American situation in the uh, year uh, 2011 when we had a congress congress congressional briefing. The American government is facing the $14 trillion. Then the Congress approved this, uh, the, uh, uh, the raising of the ceiling. But now, According to this uh, simple calculation, American debt uh, exponentially continues at 9% growth rate. It's very fast. Doubling year is only eight, less than 80 years. Then, next ceiling is 16.4 trillion, which may be coming next month or next month. So, we cannot escape, escape from this debt crisis. But this is not American the crisis. It is all OECD countries, crisis, including Japan, Greece, Iceland, Italy, Belgium, Ireland. All OECD countries are having the same debt crisis worldwide. Okay. So how we can overcome this one? The only solution under the current system is just to, to spend less. That's austerity policy or to raise tax. So in either way, the, uh, we can make some difference. The, by spending less than we can make this difference to pay off our debt. By raising tax, we can make this difference to pay off the debt. In this way, we can control debt. But this is not costless. So by doing this one, we, we trigger the recession, which is already proved in Greece. Okay. And at the same time, the GDP also uh, 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 gap increase and uh, unemployment rate increase and wage rate goes down and actually we are we are tr trapped by debt so that means our current ma macroeconomic system is a debt end debt end is uh, coined by congress machinity <laughs> he said instead of dead end we should say debt end <laughs> okay. well then here is a solution uh, of uh, uh, Chicago plans by Avin Fisher. It says, as already noted, a byproduct of the 100% reserve system would be that it would enable the government gradually to reduce its debt. So Fisher already uh, foreseen that even though it's a byproduct, Fisher's 100% money will reduce government debt. So I just checked uh, uh, with simulations we can reduce 
reduce uh, debt without causing recessions, without causing GDP gap, without causing the uh, wage reductions, and no inflations. Uh, we cannot uh, the, uh, contain foreign countries. So it's perfect solution. Okay. So in this way, the, it's obvious which system works better. It's not based on the, uh, the public sentiment. It's just based on the computer simulation. Just ask computers which system is better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then the, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I had a chance to present this idea at the congressional briefing. I just said we can liquidate debt without triggering recession, unemployment, and inflation cont uh, contagiously. Then we are facing now uh, next ceiling. Then if we can overcome this one, maybe in a couple of years, we have another next ceiling. Then next ceiling. Yeah, you can, you can ask, what will be the next ceiling? What will be the result? So this is a good simulation in, by our brains. Obviously, it's impossible to continue this uh, uh, ceiling up. So that means somewhere we have to go bankrupt. Somewhere we have to go bankrupt, OK? So to avoid this one, we really need uh, the monetary reform. So here is my conclusion. So far, so this is the current situation. And again, all economists are struggling under this school, or some uh, very conscientious economists are trying to bring this one, but without any alternative. And again, my book may provide alternative solutions with th 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 those two features. And now we like to call it public money system. So that means from now on, all economists cannot neglect our result because it's already there. So whenever they want to make some uh, proposal, they have to check with our result, then compare. Otherwise, their research are totally distorted, we could say from now on. So uh, conclusion, public money system is our sustainable future. Thank you very much, your attention.